Hello and welcome back to the Notcast, uh, episode 333, 12th of November 2023, or perhaps maybe I should call it episode 33.3, which is the speed at which the finest modern technology operates, that being the vinyl LP, uh, which has probably had a more formative role upon my life than any other piece of technology that there is apart from possibly the mobile phone. And today I'm talking about Kraftwerk's sixth studio album, Trans Europe Express, which was released in March 1977 and recorded between the end of June 1976 and August, I suspect slightly, rethought as well, uh, with perhaps some changes that have happened after some live performances of the tracks. So one of the questions I was asked was, well, what, what research do you use? How, how do you work it? And so I'm going to peel back the curtain a little bit. I'm a good magician should never show you all of his tricks. But what I am going to show you is my set list. This is my written guide to what I'm going to be saying throughout the course of uh, this particular uh, hour or so of me talking about a very old record from a very old man because I'm over 50 now. And uh, I'll, I'll pin it there to the side like a set list. Luckily, I've got no guitar pedals. I'm not going to sing Wonderwall for you. Um, and there's also, in, in the light of, of that, there's also a couple of other things which I should point out. A couple of really essential books if you're a fan of craft work. This is Carl Bartos's autobiography, The Sound of the Machine. Carl was a member of the band between 1975 and 1990, and so therefore performed on, well, let me just quickly check, Radioactivity, Trans Europe Express, Man Machine, Computer World, Electric Cafe, and The Mix. So uh, I think six really essential albums in the band's body of work. And also this book, Craftwork, I Was a Robot, written by the band's other percussionist, uh, and, uh, and live drummer Wolfgang Fleur, who again recorded with the band on those albums and also toured the Autobahn record with them in 1974. So those are both really, really essential re bits of reading. They give you a view from inside the machine as to what was going on and how it felt. Although, of course, sometimes the really fascinating stories are the ones that are never told. And you can say, well, all art is autobiography to an extent. But it's, it's kind of seen through the lens of dramatisation or recreation. And you can think everything which a, a band actually does is some form of autobiography. It just might be so obtuse so you don't really understand it. Uh, I remember seeing an interview with um, the contentious, possibly controversial, film director Brian Singer talking about the X-Men movies. And he was talking about how the storyline that was pivoted in the second and third X-Men movies about the search for a miracle cure was a metaphor for the way in which differences in society were demonised and people were hoping to cure these differences to make everybody all the same, using the existence of, of the mutants as a, a metaphor to explore that experience uh, as a, a non-heterosexual man. So that's an interesting approach which we should take. Trans Europe Express and perhaps a lot of the of the other craft work material you might not initially think about as being particularly autobiographical but there is a story within that there is an element of autobiography in the band's work or an element of a reaction to real life events which i'll talk to talk about when i talk through each of the individual songs on the album so trans europe express or as it was released in germany trans europa express uh with uh, the was the first of the craft work albums that had two distinctive separate linguistic editions. And by that, what I mean is every track, uh, apart from possibly Franz Schubert on, on these albums, were vocal. And that meant that since the albums were recorded and released in multiple languages, there are effectively two editions of the albums with two different covers. This is the international edition sung in English, uh, where every song is sung in English. And this is the German edition, where every song is sung in the band's mother tongue, of German and if you listen closely to these two versions you'll find they're actually substantially different performances and not just instrumental versions of the tracks that have then been overdubbed with different vocal tracks by the way um, the musical performances are ever so slightly different they are almost identical um, but some of the changes between them are things like for example fades effects sweeps and swoops and, and weird and unusual sounds are ever so slightly in different places so I think these are effectively two separate recordings of the same material uh, released on the same day or near enough the same day by the same act at the same time 
because the technology didn't allow necessarily fully instrumental versions of the songs to exist and then to put different vocals over the top of them. This difference is more tightly pronounced in the Computer World album, by the way, when you listen to the fades on songs like the Computer World title track itself and Home Computer. Not so obvious on here, but they are, I think, two different performances completely, by the way. So if you're a Kraftwerk fan and you only have the English language version of the album or only have the German version of the album, you're really only listening to half of the story. Uh, and if you want to go, oh, well, Kraftwerk released so little. Well, of course they did, but they did alternate versions of almost every album, actually, if you listen to them. So Trans Europe Express, Man Machine, Computer World, Electric Cafe and The Mix are the albums which substantially have almost entirely different vocals throughout almost the entire of the, the, uh, the albums. I think Tour de France soundtracks has uh, identical vocals, so there's no difference apart from the packaging between the two. Nonetheless, we need to talk about the albums and start off with, with the prehistory of the record, uh, Trans Europe Express. This, by the way, is a Fame Records edition. Fame was a um, budget version of EMI uh, when records had ceased to chart and were then sold at reduced prices. Uh, it's not something that they necessarily do these days. Um, a number of my Kraftwerk records are on Fame Records, which is effectively uh, just EMI in disguise. Um, a number of my maiden albums actually are on Fame Records as well. And I don't quite know why, uh, but um, I'm not complaining because it made them affordable for me. And when you're a teenager on a budget, uh, £3.49 for an album instead of £6 is a big difference. It means that you can buy maybe two extra drinks when you go out on a Friday night and maybe meet a girl or a boy that can make your heart go boom, boom, boom. Who knows? So fame, there it is. And uh, that's why it features on here. It includes the hit single, Showroom Dummies. The band really, really thought they had a hit in Showroom Dummies. Now, Radioactivity, the album before it, didn't chart at all, in so much as um, the singles weren't really successful. But they thought, no, Showroom Dummies is going to be a hit. And so we have a release here of Showroom Dummies from 1977, uh, which has an edit. We have uh, uh, two t further 12 inches. There was a 1977 12 inch of Showroom Dummies, but I don't have it because I didn't see much point in spending the money on something that, that replicates effectively what's on the LP. Um, there was a 1978 version of showroom do is here using the man machine design and then after the model was number one there was a 1982 remix of showroom dummies here and it was this version of showroom dummies which wasn't actually a hit despite what the cover of the uh, the fame record tells me um it wasn't actually a hit at all so it's kind of a cheeky lie to tell you that showroom dummies was a hit because it wasn't in fact, Trans Europe Express was relatively successful, and I mean relatively in absolute terms. It got to 119 in the, in the American charts, 49 in the UK in 1982. I don't think it charted in 1977. Got to 32 in Germany, and uh, surprisingly number two in France, which was a, pretty surprising, all things considered, although they couldn't translate that to... Uh, selling sufficient tickets to make a tour of France viable. Um, they did tour to Trans Europe Express, but that was before the album came out. So after the initial album sessions that took place from the end of June to middle of August 1976, a very productive six weeks, uh, the band went on the, on the road again, uh, starting in early September 76, running through to about the 11th of October, playing places like the Amsterdam Paradiso and the Camden Roundhouse. Uh, and if you've not been to the Amsterdam Paradiso, it's a gorgeous venue. The sound's not amazing, but it is a lovely venue. And on that tour, uh, the band played three songs from their upcoming LP, uh, the Trans Europe Express title track, Europe Endless, and a version of Showroom Dummies. Now, they'd, they'd started ending shows in 1974 with a track that was effectively mostly improvised. So a number of the songs that they were playing in 1974 didn't have set start or end points. The length of a song could vary by the, the length of the, the feeling that the band had, much the same way that Pink Floyd or the Grateful Dead uh, improvised their ways. And so the songs themselves, the versions that existed on the records, were effectively just templates or prototypes or skeletons upon which the live performance was built. And so for the 1974 tour, the band started ending on can't even remember what the song was now, um, but it, it kind of mutated into a new track over the course of the tour. 
And by the end of it, the ending section of the last song that they ended their sets with became very, very similar to the version of Showroom Dummies that they performed on the 1981 tour as well. So they kind of took the ending from Showroom Dummies um, and then kind of didn't put it onto the record but played it live and instead took the beginning of the song and effectively built a new song out of the live improvisation. Then took the live improvisation parts out so you have a new song completely that has no actual relation to what they've been playing. Does that make sense? I have no idea. Maybe I didn't explain it correctly. Get in the car. There is no time to explain. And by the way, whenever anybody in a movie says there's no time to explain, what they mean is I haven't thought out of how to make this work. Trust in us. There's some explosions coming. Um, so the three songs from the album, Trans Europe Express, which also included parts of Abzug and Metal on Metal, Europe Endless and Showroom Dummies were played live on the September and October 1976 tour, six months before the album was released in March 1977. And by listening to the live versions, you can really hear the process of refining and editing, which turn the songs from being very good into being classics. I will overlay this by saying that I think Trans Europe Express is, is in my opinion, the first truly classic Kraftwerk album. Autobahn and Radioactivity, very, very good. Very good, but there were elements of it where it felt that perhaps the band hadn't quite written enough material to sustain a full-length LP. Sounds bitchy. It isn't. Um, Trans Europe Express is also, by the way, the favourite Kraftwerk LP of Wolfgang Fleur. He, it's his favourite Kraftwerk album, and since he played on it, I kind of trust his judgement when he comes to talking about it. To me, Trans Europe Express is a timeless classic album that exists out of time in the way that only a a true lasting record has so if you listen to some records and you kind of go that sounds very 1991 for example that's absolutely great but you are forever kind of going to be defined by that point in time that you have been uh, kind of pinned down to and you can't escape you know you look at the, some of the albums that have pictures of artists on the front those haircuts there are classic. If it was 1987 and they'd all been mullets and they were wearing, you know, multicoloured bikini shorts, for example, uh, you might then kind of go, yeah, I prefer my albums without covers or, or without pictures of the band on the cover. Totally agree with that, by the way, because then you end up kind of looking at some of the albums and going, that's 1987 or that's 1982, for example. Or a, a character in Pulp Fiction that's called you, Flock of Seagulls, doesn't actually have a name. Probably does have a name, but doesn't live very long, so it doesn't matter. With Trans Europe Express, it exists almost outside of history. It's a, a record that touches into classic themes that have remained static as part of the human experience for decades and decades, either side of the release of the record. And that's where you have a truly classic record that has a longevity. Some records, let's say Elvis's first, for example, The Clash is London Calling, great albums, but they are tied to a sense of time and space that cannot be replicated, and so therefore automatically become, whether they like it or not, history pieces. Other albums exist outside of history and remain speaking to us on a consistent basis ever since. And that's where Trans Europe Express is. It is an album that explores the themes of travel, intersections with with that um, themes of, of culture nationality technology it's almost like a poem to civilization from the opening notes of europe endless to the closing moments of franz schubert and endless endless uh, a song that is book a song that bookends in two various forms the beginning and the end of the lp um, as Wolfgang Fleur described it at the time, and this is part of, I think, why the album has such a, an eternal sense to it, is we were children born after World War II. There was no music or culture of our own. Effectively, they were looking at almost a year zero. The cities were being rebuilt after 1945 and after the Second World War. History had been approached from a completely different, different angle to most people's approach to history. So, for example, if you're in the UK, um, you will often be taught that the Second World War was glorious because we defeated evil Hitler, and that um, other parts of history... Uh, Britain always paints itself as the Gandalf of history, where it's probably more like the Saruman in terms of how it's, how it's treated other nations. 
Um, whereas for Germany, I think post World War II, there is an element of almost history being something to be ashamed of or something to be disowned, something to be put into a box and not really talked about. And I was thinking about this when I was reading Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography, uh, which is probably not a sentence you were expecting me to say. It wasn't a book I was expecting to read, but I did. Where talking about growing up in, in Austria and having you know, parents, uncles, for example, that were prominent in the uh, in the fascist regime in the 30s and 40s um, and still kind of proud of that, but felt that they'd been cheated by history. And so therefore um, there was also I think some the laws were changed in Germany, so you couldn't necessarily display the swastika. And so therefore they were, they were kind of going, well, actually, we have to hide these things that were once part of our cultural identity. And imagine if you were born in, let's say, 1948 in Germany, uh, your memories were of a nation that was being rebuilt, a nation that was uh, had a very complicated relationship to history, probably denying parts of its history ever existed or being ashamed of it, and then kind of having to, to find a sense of cultural identity by listening to culture and history that came from outside of your own country. Uh, and this is where America in particular dominated the cultural hegemony, well, I think that's how it's pronounced, um, by, uh, you know, monopolising the airwaves and the cinema screens with Elvis Presley, uh, UK with the Beatles and James Bond. Um, the idea of homegrown culture uh, was something that, that wasn't particularly high profile at that point. And so there was a blank slate. There was no inherited culture that was native to the country, which necessarily needed to be talked about. Um, and so therefore they were rebuilding a history, rebuilding a language. It was an imposition or a flex of what's called soft power um, over the rest of, of, of Europe by uh, uh, English speaking nations, specifically more likely America, which still had um, you know, military bases in the UK and in Germany. And the UK's cult, uh, the UK and the US's cultural leg legacy kind of stood over um, the natural context of history. So Kraftwerk were a band which, to me at least, felt like they were completely outside of contemporary history. And for example, if I'd have grown up and suddenly what I thought was actually everything that my country had done before about the age of five was something which was uh, verboten or something which was forbidden and something which couldn't really be talked about with any sense of pride whatsoever. They have a really interesting approach to how you view the concept of nations and countries. And so opening up the opening track, Europe Endless, there's this concept that actually Europe is actually a whole. It's united by rail and road as seen uh, and radio as seen in Autobahn, Radio Activity and Trans Europe Express. Um, Europe, the, the idea of a nation was perhaps a little bit provincial. Whereas actually, if, for example, certain places, you go over a bridge, suddenly you're no longer in Belgium, you're in Holland, for example. Or in the UK, if you go from uh, England to Scotland, or if you go from England to Wales on the train, there's no difference. There's no passport checks or anything. You're just in a different country and nobody really cares too much necessarily that you've moved from one country to another. Unless, of course, you watch the American TV shows where someone's racing to get across state lines so the police don't chase them. Uh, obviously, I don't watch films like that. Actually, I do, but don't tell anybody. Um, the idea that uh, the concept of nation, states, or or any or, or even provinces are kind of outmoded. And Trans Europe Express as an album is a hymn to the communication and the, the linking up of disparate states, nations, and individuals into one unified whole. There's a sense in, in Trans Europe Express that Europe as a whole is actually one ecosystem, both a one economic system and one um, ecosystem in, ter in terms of um, the, what's the word I'm thinking of here? You know, the, uh, the, the, um, the environment which is actually the idea of nations and borders is arbitrary and effectively not necessarily relevant. Um, and so Europe Endless, which is, by the way, my favourite Kraftwerk song, uh, I probably haven't articulated that yet, opens the album on what I regard to be uh, just one of the finest pieces of music that I've ever heard. It's my favourite Kraftwerk song. It's a song that details the romance of possibility, the intoxication of potential. And it's about, it also uses um, new technology. So it's the first use of what's called the Syntharama sequencer, which is the 32 step, 16 channel sequencer, where effectively you can set the tempo, you can modulate the, um, the, the, the notes that come through it. So instead of having to repeat the notes, you can effectively just, just program it and it repeats itself on a loop. Um, obviously, it's massively outdated now, but at the time it was revolutionary. It meant that you no longer had to tap out, you know, 800 times 
the same sequence that you needed to just tap it out once and there you were and, and then it would repeat itself and you didn't have to worry about it and over the top of that you could then place the melodies the drums the percussion the vocals the sound effects um, and the, se the sequence of notes the skeleton of notes was programmed in by the band members ralph programmed the bass in uh, and then it's um carl and wolfgang although officially the band's percussionists um carl was was, was playing keyboards sequences drums percussion adding vocals and melody lines as well so effectively at that point this is where the album became effectively in terms of a composing unit a trio of hutter schneider and bartos the finest songwriting trio of all time better than stock aiken and waterman better than lamont dozier and holland and of course um, other songwriting trios that i've temporarily forgotten including malcolm and angus young and brian johnson or bon Scott. Hutter Schneider Bartos, the finest songwriting trio of all time. And the title track, Euro, well, not the title track, but Europe Endless uh, reminded Carl very much of a track by Strauss called The Gypsy Baron. And if you listen to The Gypsy Baron, and I have, you can hear the similarities in terms of the approach and the sound which you have for the song. Europe Endless is nine and a half minutes of absolute beauty. It is so glorious and so elegant it should be on a wall in a museum it, it is one of the most beautiful pieces of music i've ever heard incidentally it was never a single in fact i don't think it was played live after 1976 until 2012 when the band played the museum of modern art in new york it was however a seven inch b-side and so um, if i can find it very quickly the b-side to the original release of showroom dummies somewhat bizarrely is an edit of europe endless the idea of editing a track called europe endless is um deeply ironic and uh jock mimi who um does some fantastic artwork by the way did point that out uh, the other day to me and i was like yes of course why didn't i see that um, but the, the idea of an edit of Europe Endless is bizarre and, in fact, a little bit strange. On the single that was released from the album, the first single to be released from the album was Trans Europe Express, but in the UK, I think it was Showroom Dummies. But we'll get to that when we talk about Showroom Dummies. It was also a seven-inch single in Argentina, which is a bizarre state of affairs. It really is. Uh, I did look at buying a copy of it. It was staggeringly expensive. It was about starting at about £70. I decided not to, because no matter how much I love craft work, I think I need £70 more for something else. Uh, track two on the album is Hall of Mirrors, uh, a song that is sometimes quoted by various bands, including, um, I've seen U2 play Hall of Mirrors, or at least a part of Hall of Mirrors, sometimes during some of their tours. Um, it is, as I've mentioned earlier, a form of autobiography, um, although it may not necessarily see it. So Hall of Mirrors as a track is a song around an artist seeing himself reflected in a hall of mirrors and the original cover for the album was due to be craft work in their studio surrounded by mirrors uh, photographed endlessly repeating themselves and with each kind of repeat of themselves in the mirror slowly losing definition and and um and slowly losing their focus as they kind of faded away into the into the background so if you've ever stood between two mirrors and you're looking you can see end up you see thousands of yourself in either direction as far as the eye can see it was a visual trick that the band were hoping to do for the cover of trans europe express uh, but the original idea was scrapped after they saw the cover of a frip eno album called no pussyfooting which features well uh, frip and eno standing in a hall of mirrors uh, as they faded away into the distance and lost definition and focus. So they thought, no, the idea is we can't really copy that. Instead, what they did, and this is where uh, the cover art to Trans Europe Express or the German edition, of course, Trans Europa Express, in either form um, is, is quite sly, is you have a representation of what looks like a firm of solicitors or, or perhaps, uh, you know, a modern design team of architects as opposed to uh, a contemporary pop combo uh, making futuristic electronic music. The idea is that Kraftwerk, instead of saying, well, we are the robots, although obviously that is what they did do, but instead of painting themselves as futuristic, painted themselves as a form of futurism from a future that never really existed, a retro-futurism, uh, if you like. 
and then took the idea of, of actually becoming pretty bland and pretty beige. So the cover itself tells you nothing about the contents of what's inside the record whatsoever. Um, it draws attention away from the individual, even in the fact that when people wear suits, for example, the idea or the concept of a suit is to very clearly demarcate between the head and the body, is to separate the two, and then also, like school uniforms, because people are wearing suits, is to draw attention away from any differences that come from personal um, expression through dress and fashion but to actually say actually fashion doesn't matter it's a uniform and what matters is the people but it's it's kind of almost depower the concept of individualization through suits you wonder why people in offices wear suits it's so that we all look the bloody same and none of us have any personality at all we are the robots indeed um, which is why of course there's nothing wrong with wearing an occasionally not 100 percent boring shirt in the office, which I have been guilty of doing from time to time. Um, but that is, uh, you know, the way in which the, the cover art represents also the concept and the ideas behind Hall of Mirrors. And Craftwork are also kind of addressing the, the, the nature of fame despite having fame written on the record, is that they were, you know, Autobahn had been a hit. They were selling substantial numbers of albums at this point. They were becoming a little bit more successful. Um, there was a, an idea there that perhaps the band as a whole was starting to be a little more recognised, even though they, some of them were still, for example, studying or, or working at other jobs whilst the band was also operating. So Carl, for example, sat his exams just before the uh, recording of the album at the end of June 1976. And Hall of Mirrors is autobiographical to an extent because it talks about the gap between image and identity, between uh, reality and representation of that. So, for example, the artist sees himself reflected in a mirror and the image was perverted. Um, it, the idea of um, the sound of Hall of Mirrors kind of talks about the gap between who you think you are and who other people think you are. And the idea that you know, these, these four people, this man machine of, of uh, musical workers that didn't really have an identity in their own right. And um, oddly enough, by the way, uh, I think Hall of Mirrors has a keyboard solo from Carl Bartos. Florian Schneider, by the way, was, was starting to, to go into So the band were clearly demarcating their roles within the group. Um, Wolfgang was playing percussion. Uh, Carl was playing keyboards and adding melodies and sometimes percussion as well. Uh, Ralph was programming bass and synthesizers. And Florian was, was working in the terms of, of sound and texture, not melodic as such, but in terms of the sonics of it, the production of it, the texture of it, what made the sounds work and working also on uh, voice to speech synthesis. Um, Carl describes it as a kind of sonic Jackson Pollock, a kind of a, a a combination of, of individual elements that on their own wouldn't necessarily look like they belong. Almost a sonic lasagna, actually. Uh, and creating a song that, that works as a statement upon the nature of fame and identity and going, there is, you know, the version of me that you see or the picture of me is not the one that is really me, if that makes sense. So wearing suits on stage, for example, squashing differences in individuality and identity, and being aware that for a lot of people, fame is actually a, a, a kind of like a personality reduction machine, is it reduces you to, well, a hat or a leather jacket or a guitar or a wireframe suit, um, whatever it is that you might have, and go, well, that's who you are. And bearing in mind that the audience that any band has, we can only carry so much space in our brains about well, what does this mean? What is this? You know, Kraftwerk, there's these four humorless German dudes in wireframe unit suits, and it doesn't really matter who, who any of them actually is. And judging the approach that Kraftwerk have to making announcements when people leave the group, that's probably very true, actually, because it doesn't really matter. Florian left, and nobody knew he'd left for about 18 months until they played a show. Nobody knew that Fritz had left until he didn't play a show, and he hasn't played a show with the group for six months now. Um, Nobody really knew that Carl had left the band until um, the, the mix was released. And nobody, by the way, really realised that his, his contribution to the mix album was so substantial. Uh, although he apparently all his programming and stuff is, was retained on the LP. If you look at the credits to the mix album, uh, Carl Bartos certainly wasn't mentioned as a performer or producer in the group at the time on its initial release. Possibly not afterwards so that's hall of mirrors for you and the idea that the the concept of identity the public eye versus the private eye has become um disconnected and there isn't necessarily a relationship 
between the two. The next thing that we have, track three, showroom dummies. Now, I've, I've mentioned showroom dummies a couple of times. Uh, this is where I get to show off a couple of records because, hey, why not? This is what this is all about. Showroom Dummies was a single from the album in the UK. Here's the 7-inch uh, the of it, which you've seen earlier, uh, which features an edited version of Showroom Dummies. Um, there was a 12-inch release of Showroom Dummies, which came in a picture sleeve in 1977, but it was backed with a full LP mix of Europe Endless. In 1978, Showroom Dummies got another release, this time backed with Europe Endless and Space Lab. Uh, but using the um, the Man Machine era uh, designs there. Uh, so Europe Endless was uh, side side two on there, and um, Showroom Dummies and Space Lab there. So it was different from the 1977 release. And as I said, after the model became a number one in 1982, a third release of Showroom Dummies. Here's the 12 inch, and here is the seven inch version of Showroom Dummies. Uh, this featured a remix of Showroom Dummies with additional percussion, and it's backed with, on this, a 7-inch mix of Numbers, and on that, a 7-inch mix of Numbers, and a previous, not quite successful hit single called Pocket Calculator. Um, quite why they didn't use the uh, French or German language versions as B-sides, I don't quite know. It seemed to me a little bit lazy, actually. Uh, but uh, but there you are. So Showroom Dummies coming in at a staggering 2 minutes 38 seconds on the 12-inch. Um, which is, to me, it feels not long enough, actually, and it doesn't really reflect my understanding of how long Showroom Dummies is. When I listen to Showroom Dummies, it feels longer than 2 minutes 38 seconds. Um, showroom Dummies takes its name from, the, from, a, from a line uh, that described the band's static live performances uh, that said that, effectively, um, the band... Were, she were about as animated as showroom dummies on stage, and the, 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 the could have been showroom dummies, which obviously was then followed up with the the We Are the Robots live performances in future, which was actually you know robotic showroom dummies. Um, it was also a sly comment upon the band's visual representation and identity. Um, so the idea of these four featureless static people on stage not doing very much. It's, I think, a great song. It's very funny. It's very dark. Uh, the UK lyrics have, have lines like, we're standing here exposing ourselves, uh, and suddenly we walk and we walk through the glass and there's a, you know, the sound of breaking glass and you kind of go. So it's, it's got a dark sense of humour, very sly, very dry, which is possibly why I think um, it, it was... Craftwork resonated a lot with the British audiences because you think about some of the, the sly, dark British humour that we have, effectively laughing in the face of danger and tragedy. It's that kind of sense of humour that we've got. Craftwork, uh, but also there's a very cheeky little nod to the Ramones uh, with the opening words of Showroom Dummies being Ein, zwei, drei, vier, one, two, three, four. Uh, you know, Florian was a punk rocker, etc. That type of thing. Uh, because the Ramones were quite popular in 1977 uh, with, with tracks like Blitzkrieg, Bop and so on. So Kraftwerk weren't operating in isolation. They were making a, a sly comment there upon the nature of punk, which perhaps flew over quite a few heads, including mine, until one day I listened to it and thought, are they just taking the piss out of the Ramones? Is that a tribute? Yeah, it's a tribute. It's not the greatest song in the world. It's a tribute. And Showroom Dummies is one of the finest of the Kraftwerk tracks that there is. Luckily, I've seen them play it many times, and every time, it's a banger. Although I think banger is probably overstating uh, what, what it is. When I saw Kraftwerk for the first time in 1992, they, it, was, it was like a, um, an, a party or a euphoric kind of riding the wave of electronica. Uh, now, when I've seen Kraftwerk, and the last time I saw them was uh, six years ago, it felt like I was watching a museum piece or a, a classical recital as opposed to a, a classic band playing an amazing gig. So, flip the LP over, side two, Trans Europe Express, the title track itself, which was released as a seven-inch single in, uh, in some countries. Here is uh, the, I think this is the French one on Pathé Marconi. What a gorgeous cover that is, isn't it? What an absolutely gorgeous cover that Trans Europe Express 7-inch single is. Um, and that, that features uh, one of the TGVs. Well, they're now called TGVs. The Trans Europe Express doesn't exist. 
and there's the seven inch in the vacuum in, in the molded sleeve there from um capital uh saying treasure up express four minutes backed with i'm guessing franz schubert let's quickly check yes it is franz schubert which has uh, again an exclusive mix of franz schubert there uh on on, on the b-side um, and the seven inch mixes by the way of the b-sides of uh Trans europe express and europe endless are just edits of the lp mixes you're not missing anything it is literally just let's have a fade before a part of it comes in so there's trans europe express as a seven inch and again this was trans europe express was played live in 1976 it has a different melody line in 1976 although the song is substantially the same in the live performance in 1976 like europe endless the song has a different melody so the standard one two three four five six you know seven or eight notes that you have that make up the trans europe express express motif they're played differently and they're played in a different modulation and a different speed and with a different attack on the live version so you can listen to it and kind of go almost so the original melody for trans europe express which presumably was the one that they recorded when they recorded the album in uh, June to August 1976 was then changed after live performances to reflect the cleaner, slicker, more, uh, more flatter, more elegant line which you'll have on Trans Europe Express now. If there was a 12 inch Trans Europe Express in 1977, I've not heard of it, not to say that it doesn't exist, uh, but I've not heard of it. But there was a 7 inch which apparently went to, um, well, did very well in the charts in France. And Trans Europe Express, as a title track, is, in my opinion, uh, one of Kraftwerk's most perfect songs. So it features um, a number of, of key elements which will repeat themselves endlessly throughout the rest of the Kraftwerk body of work. First and foremost, I should point out, um, the single, I think, got to number 67 in the US charts. I don't know where else it got to in the charts, uh, apparently it was inspired by a track called Pacific 231 um, by a name that I can't read at the moment, uh, Anton Honig, I think, possibly, uh, which when you think about Pacific 231, and if you've listened to it uh, or you've seen or you've Googled the Pacific 231 locomotive, that Pacific 231 locomotive was used in the video and in the films as well. So there's a very clear kind of lineage between the music of the past and and the, and the present uh, so the train the pacific 231 model did appear in the in the video for trans europe express that was broadcast or shown on the, the band's film screens during the the live performances um, it's also comes in three parts so there are three songs uh, depending upon which version of the album you are listening to if you listen to the uk version it says there are tracks called trans europe express and metal on metal if you listen to the German versions, uh, we have Trans Europa Express, Metal Auf Metal, and Abzug. Abzug, by the way, translates out of German to departure. And the music is exactly the same. The track splits are different. So if you have the UK version, you don't, you don't have an extra track on the German version of Trans Europe Express. You just have a different banding point that tells you that Abzug starts somewhere slightly differently in the big scheme of things. Don't be fooled by the hype. It's not a new song that's only on the German version. It's just a different name for the same piece of music that's also part of Metal on Metal. And Metal on Metal is, I think, really, really influential on industrial music. It's the use of found sound and music concrete, as you'll have heard also from radioactivity. An autobahn, the sound of, for example, revving engines, gear sticks, radio tuning. Uh, metal on Metal effectively takes its name from the clang of railway buffers as the, uh, the two carriages bang against each other. The sound of the choo-choo of the train, the clang, dong of, the, of the, um, the buffers and the connectors that keep the carriages together as they join. And they're connected and built to sound like someone's taken actually the rhythm of the industrialised nation and turned it into a record. It's a fantastic and cheeky sonic motif. And it's hugely influential uh, if you later listen to acts like Front 242, Knights of Reb, or Nine Inch Nails uh, and, and Depeche Mode actually for the Construction Time Again album, you'll hear a similar use of clanging pieces of metal to represent the industrialised world, factories, civilization, engines, industry and the machineries of joy. Um, hugely influential. Also 
by the way, um, the, the simple uh, motifs that you will have musically, can, you can listen to them, the very simple melodic, straightforward notes that you have, very reminiscent of uh, both the Stooges and, as previously mentioned, the Ramones, uh, both of whom are one of Ralph's favourite bands. Not that you would necessarily know by listening to this. You really, really wouldn't, but it's all there. Effectively, the sound of the epic um, track, Trans Europe Express, is the rhythm of reality. It's the heartbeat of the city. It represents the clink and the clang uh, of, of modern technology and machinery as it operates. The power station, Kraftwerk itself, the sound of technology as it transforms the modern life. Um, it's, it's just a gorgeous, brilliant song that is played live to this day. And I never, ever doubt its power. Every time I've seen Kraftwerk, they played Trans Europe Express. And every time I've seen them play Trans Europe Express, I have been overjoyed with how brilliant the sound is. Uh, it's just absolutely wonderful. So, we have the last two tracks on the album are Franz Schubert and Endless Endless. Or on this, Franz Schubert and Endless Endless. By the way, and I think these two are exactly the same on the on the German and the English versions of the album. By the way, should point that out so uh, you're not missing anything there. And Franz Schubert kind of takes um, some of the melodic ideas that have come from the uh, synthorama sequencer that that appeared on Endless Endless and twisted them and bent them a little bit and took 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 those ideas from a slightly different angle. So you can listen to them as an A and a B side of each other, by the way, um, and then turns into Endless Endless, which is a repeat of the the motif of Europe Endless, but, but vocalised as Endless Endless, as a, a synthesised voice fading into nothingness. The idea across the whole of the album is the idea of joining together travel and communication and reality the idea of perception of identity the notion of identity the concept of, of nations and provinces as being somewhat meaningless when telescoped together by technology and the technology of of trains and travel of um the idea of nations itself with the track europe endless is kind of like the most anti-brexit song ever i think probably because what it effectively says is that europe is the identity germany france holland belgium sweden the uk they're all parts of the same thing the same part of the world and it's almost like a, a, a not a hymn necessarily but a hopeful kind of message to the world that the concept of nations is outdated and the concept of division is outdated is that we could be unified together in one trans europe express one single kind of transport system uh, that the idea of, of uh, and this is addressed in um, hall of mirrors and showroom dummies the gap between how people perceive you to be and who you really are and the nation of identity travel and communication between the two is that we as humans are all effectively kind of the same and uh, we all we all kind of need to work together as one unified entity to create the best outcomes for humanity as a whole. Also, Trans Europe Express has a a very um, interesting lyric about uh, going to Düsseldorf City to meet Iggy Pop and David Bowie. Uh, Iggy Pop and David Bowie had moved to Berlin in 1977. Bowie was a huge fan of Kraftwerk. He played their material before he went on stage on the 1978 tour um, and was vocal in his love of the group. And if you listen to the album's low heroes, parts of station to station and its use of found sound, especially on the title track, um, you can very clearly, clearly see and hear the Kraftwerk influence upon the, uh, the Berlin trilogy. There is debate about where the Berlin trilogy starts and ends, but we're not getting into that conversation because that's actually about 200 episodes in the past. Trans Europe Express is a, a classic LP that I have never tired of for one second throughout the whole of my life. Uh, effectively joining together the idea of nations, identity, reality, communication, and the best albums ever will tell you what is it like to be alive, both at the time that the record came out and in the years afterwards. And the strength of the message in Trans Europe Express has not been diluted one inch by anything that's happened ever since its release. It's a timeless album that exists 
outside of things like politics and history, but in fact talking on a very basic human level to the existence of us as people. You know, nations, identities, they're all kind of in the mix there, and they're all things that we need to take into account. It's also a hymn to the unified power of the European Union, where there are effectively no borders and no countries, but there is a, a, a wider community that's bigger than a nation or a province or a, or a telephone code or a postcode, where we all work together as one, uh, as one human entity on the planet as a whole. Right, that sounds like I've um, told you for 45 minutes about how amazing this LP is. There are a couple of other things which I was going to mention, which I haven't quite mentioned yet, which I'm going to. This was also, by the way, I think the first album where, where the band as a whole felt to me that they were a cohesive unit of four people. It felt more organic um, and, and the demarcation of ideas became both fluid and solid at the same time. Carl and Wolfgang might have been performers, but they weren't just performers in a musical sense. To me, it felt like they were part of the corners of the table. Uh, they were uh, theorists and they were writers and they were improvising the songs live and building upon the songs live and live performance. So even though the writing credits don't necessarily always reflect who is on the record, the record could only have existed and been as, as uh, powerful and as fully realised as it was through the fact that some of those songs uh, about half of the songs were played live before they were released. And uh, as, as you probably know, in the days before when everyone had a camera phone, you could play new songs live and you could work out the kinks on stage in front of people. And the more you play a song, the better you get at having a definitive arrangement. And Trans Europe Express is one of my very favourite Kraftwerk LPs. As previously mentioned, of course, the German language version comes in a slightly different cover. It has different performances and different languages, and there are some linguistic differences, uh, which means that some of the some of the, the the nuances of the sound get lost in translation between the two LPs. Other releases, of course, other releases. So, nineteen ninety seven saw the release of uh, a promotional box set. Uh, to tie in with the band's appearance at the Tribal Gathering Festival in Luton. I went to that amazing gig, and that saw the, t the release of a 33 RPM promotional 12-inch of Trans Europe Express. Here it is. It's backed with an instrumental version of the track, which is not actually uh, in any way really vastly interesting. Although it says it's an, uh, an instrumental here, and the music is by Ralph Hutter, um, it's just a really an extended edit of other parts of the song. It's nothing exciting. Don't spend huge amounts of money trying to get this 12 inch, by the way, because frankly, it's just not worth it. Um, there was also uh, CD releases. So CD, the first CD releases of the album before the, uh, the remastered versions, these were issued in about 1988 or thereabouts. There's the English language original CD. This is the, uh, the capital version from America. Here's the German language CD from 1994 I bought from Amazon Germany. Um, and uh, it is, you know, basically before remastering, these were flat cassette masters um, of, the, of the original tracks. There was also, somewhat surprisingly, in America, a Trans Europe Express CD single. Uh, one of the first Kraftwerk CD singles, I think this was released in 1990. And this features the LP version and the single fade of Trans Europe Express and is backed with Showroom Dummies and a new track called Les Mannequins, which isn't a new track at all. It's a French language version of Showroom Dummies that was used on the French version of the LP, by the way. So uh, if you want to get Les Mannequins, the French language version of Showroom Dummies, I think this is the most recent release that the track has had from 1990. 2004 saw the release of, or more correctly, saw the proposed release of the catalogue box set, which featured 2004 remasters with proposed expanded um, artwork. It's, uh, and it, this promo box set was never released. Uh, there were a limited number that were issued as pr promotional CDs. And it did feature, for the first time, an alternate standardised cover for Trans Europe Express here. This cover was also used for the 2009 remasters of the album. And in 2020, 
coloured vinyl editions of the remasters were issued. This is the German language version Trans Europa Express, which was the first UK release of the German version of Trans Europe Express. This time in a, uh, a picture sleeve there. And also, oh, and I've got a, I've got a little post-it note on there that tells me it skips on showroom dummies and hall of mirrors. Um, and that is a, a uh, because the band had very, very expensive record players and therefore uh, play fine on their very, very expensive record players and not on my not quite very expensive record player. So there we have it. And the back featured photographs of the four mannequins or showroom dummies that the band were using as part of their visual representations. The 2009 remasters and the 2020 versions as well also featured uh, expanded editions of the artwork. So this is artwork because the artwork wasn't standardised across the world. As you've seen, the covers for the German and the English versions are different. The cover for the singles are different. Effectively, this created one world standardised version of the artwork. So that's some uh, illustrations, which I think were by Florian. Photographs of the band members at Dusseldorf train station. Also uh, photographs of the uh, showroom dummies taken from the, the uh, promotional video, which was also shown on the screens. Uh, photographs from the, the sessions which were used to create the album artwork. And of course, there's a different photograph on the German and the UK releases of the album, alongside photographs of the showroom dummies themselves and some extra material and uh, typographical information. It effectively is, and this is quite weird actually, because I think this might be, uh, you know, Ralph and Florian here alongside the four showroom dummies there. Uh, this special edition of vinyl, if you are going to get a vinyl version of the albums, these are really, really good versions to get. Also, originals from the time are becoming really quite expensive indeed. Um, the last release that we had for Trans Europe Express was the 2017 3D The Catalogue box set, which I mention every episode, uh, featuring reimagined, rethought, remixed, re recorded, rearranged versions of each one of the, the band's core eight studio albums. So, the official Kraftwerk discography of their eight albums running from Autobahn through to Tour de France, was re-recorded uh, by the new lineup of the group, Ralph Hutter, Fritz Hilpert, Henning Schmitz and Falk Griffingen. Uh, the Trans Europe Express disc here is quite short, it's about half an hour, um, but there is no other band that has ever done anything quite as glorious as the 3D catalogue representing their body of work in uh, modern, renovated fashion. And uh, I, I strongly, strongly recommend this box set, by the way. If you're a fan of the band and you kind of go, well, what does the band sound like? Now, 3D, the catalogue, is exactly and precisely the release that you need to experience. So, in conclusion, Trans Europe Express is one of my favourite albums of all time. I absolutely love it to bits. I can say nothing negative about it at all. It is a glorious, fully realised uh, presentation of a concept around um, nationalism, identity, travel, technology that explores the, the, the themes of what is it like to be stepping into the future. And 1977, when this came out, the year that Star Wars was released, the year that Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Nevermind the Bollocks came out, the year where it felt like the world was starting to step very clearly and definitively into the last quarter of the 20th century and opening its eyes. So stepping out of the previous 25 years, which would have started, let's say, 1950, after the Second World War, with a period of consolidation and rebuilding into the race towards the future, which became the last 25 years of the 20th century. It's a brilliant album. I love it to bits, and I strongly recommend that you listen to it. Uh, and if you don't, that's great too. There's lots of great records in the world. None of them have been made by Genesis, um, but there are lots of great records in the world. And if you don't like Trans Europe Express, I'm sure you can find something else that you like somewhere, either on your shelves or the ones behind me. So uh, stay beautiful, take care of yourselves and each other, and I will see you all soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.